I'm here with Greg and we're in part of his fabulous car collection, which as you can probably tell, has a heavy emphasis on Chevrolet performance. Greg, thanks for having me in to spotlight one of my personal favorites, this Camaro behind us. You're, you're sure welcome, Matt. We're glad to have you here. Uh, it's a car that we're very proud of. It's a rather unique car. No one knows better than you. And we're glad to share it with you today in your group. So it is a 2002 Berger Supercar Dick Harrell Edition, car number uh, 28 of the run. And one of the unique aspects of the car, before we get to the modifications and uh, enhancements to it, you are the original owner. That we are. Uh, we, uh, you know, I, I heard about this car. I had a couple of cars uh, from, uh, from Matt Murphy and his group and uh, Scott Settlemeyer told me about the car and uh, I got very interested. And I'm also, uh, Matt Berger actually happens to be a, a personal friend of mine and I've always followed his and his family's love of performance cars. And I thought, you know what? I probably should get one of those. Um, so that was kind of all those people pulling me one direction and then we ended up with it I'm, and I'm glad that we did. So uh, Fortune Camaro production was ending in 2002. This was kind of a last hurrah, as you mentioned, with the team at Berger Chevrolet and GMMG and Matt Murphy's team to kind of build the ultimate uh, Fortune Camaro, pulling a lot from that Sunoco um, uh, Woodward Dream Cruise car that General Motors put together. But this was something that was going to be over the top. So after all those balls got in motion and you decided you wanted one, from there, how did you go about kind of crafting it to your liking? Well, actually, I was probably one of the tail end uh, customers. You know, our car is number 28, and there's somewhere in the low 30s. You know way better than me. But I kind of came at the end of the, the, the chain, and there, most of the cars had been spoken for. There were only a couple, three left. And, uh, you know, the, some of the things perhaps that I would have wanted to do wasn't available. And Matt said, hey, you know, we have this. And it happened to be a white car. I like white cars. Uh, and I thought, well, then that's got to be the car. But I was at the very end of the, of the cycle in the build, and I think there were just a couple, three uh, that came out after the one we got. So looking through the documentation that you have with the car, you've got all the, all the right paperwork for provenance, which is great, helps tell the story. Sure. Um, it looks like the, a lot of this communication was around the 04, 05, 06 time frame. Do you recall at all when that car actually uh, arrived to you on site? Well, it was a very lengthy process, it's, uh, and, and it took uh, longer than I. <laughs> we, when you're building a car, you always want it to get done. But I'm going to say from start to finish, it was well over two years. And there was some delays that I think Matt had with his group, uh, various things. I don't exactly remember what they were. But uh, the good thing is we carried it on through. And as I said, it was probably at the end of the line, the end of the run. And I think they were kind of like, we need to get this finished up because we need to get on to other things. So uh, it was uh, close to three years from start to finish. And so when it finally arrived to you and you saw it, I'm guessing come out of the trailer or off the truck, kind of what, what went through your head? Was it the Camaro that you thought it was going to be? It, it was. It, I mean, the, the car that you referenced, the early car, the, uh, the Trans Am car, the, the beautiful blue car, I was hoping that it would look like that. I, I would have liked to have had a blue one, but I also knew, you know, I wanted to keep the paint original. I wasn't one of the owners that chose to have the car painted. And, and I, as I said earlier, I like white cars. But no, I was, I was blown away by it. You know, the body modifications on this car were way ahead of its time. Uh, people, you know, they didn't do things like that in the early 2000s, typically on production cars. Uh, and it was very well executed. Uh, you know, GMM, GMMG did a great job of putting our whole package together, and they kept the theme from the original Trans Am car that you were talking about that was on Woodward. Right. You know, and one of the things from my travels and research, and part of my, my interest in these vehicles is what you identified, the high level of consistency mm -hmm. and uh, craftsmanship that went into the cars. You know, there's a lot of outfits, I feel like, that come along in the automotive space that can put together... Uh, you know, a handful of high performance cars, but typically the build quality is all over the map. What, what Matt Berger and Matt Murphy did with these cars is really incredible. Speaks to their testament of, of kind of what they wanted to do with these cars. Now, dive a little bit more into the specs on your car. There were several different engine options. Which one is yours equipped with? Uh, I believe it's the uh, version two. 
The, Isn't it, is, uh, is it not? Is it version three? Is version, it the, it, I think it's a phase three, 427. Yes, okay. Yeah, the C5 you had to help me out. I, that's okay. Yeah. You know your, my car better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed, that's but okay. that's okay. That's sure. good. I'm, I'm glad you're doing this, so that's that's yeah. great. But okay. So, Thanks so you, for helping me. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got that. So you've got the, the phase three, uh, 427, which uh, you're a Chevy guy. You know that that 427 in any Camaro is cool because obviously that harkens back to those first gen, particularly the Copos and the, the dealer conversion. So that's really cool. That was a neat thing that I like about these cars is that there are a lot of nods to heritage, including Dick Harrell. I'm sure you're familiar with him as with his drag racing efforts. Sure. Um, and that kind of leads to my next question is, I know that you and your dad have decades of experience uh, with Chevrolet uh, running a family dealership. Um, and you mentioned that you had a love of Camaros. How has um, kind of your interest for Chevrolet performance kind of grown over your many years in the business? Well, you know, I'm second generation in the business and uh, it's interesting that I would say probably half the people that are in the car business really enjoy it in cars and different types of cars. The other half look at, at cars as really an appliance. They, they It's just a, an article that they're selling, but I know, I guess I got that love from my father who particularly enjoyed automobiles and um, having grown up in my age and my time, uh, you know, I aspired, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have a 427 Camaro when I was going to high school. I had a Corvair, so I think my father was pretty smart in that he didn't put me in something that I wasn't capable of handling. Sure. So, sure. so as you know, you get older and you have the ability to do things, you know, you can go back just like a lot of people do and, and try to go back and get the car that you would have liked to have when you were in high school. So from that Corvair in your youth, or uh, did you ever get to upgrade to a Camaro as a daily driver for a, a season? Well, I, it's funny you should say that. When we moved here in 1969, uh, we were just starting and it was, uh, it, was, it was a challenging time for us. And I said to my father, well, I sold, we sold my Corvair, what am I gonna have to drive? And you, this, is, uh, this is kind of unbelievable, but it was an Indy Pace car, the white 69 Camaro. Sure. And I thought, well, how cool is this? It wasn't a 396, but it was a, it was a, a correct 350 car with air. And uh, I thought, wow, I am so blessed. Well, that lasted a week because he sold it within a week. And uh, I was back to driving something else, probably a Nova or something. But I did get to drive one, and I wish I had that car today. Uh, I did get to drive one for weeks. So I laughed when you said a season. <laughs> when you're in the car business, <laughs> right. things, cars things change move. quickly. Sure. So, change quickly. Uh, with, the, uh, with the Dick Harrell Camaro behind us, um, it's got super low miles, just several hundred on it. You've really done a great job of preserving it. Uh, showcasing it. Have you had the chance to get it out and about at any kind of area, events, or shows? You know, actually, we haven't. Uh, I have driven the car a couple, three times. I'm really, frankly, trying to be very careful with it and preserve it. I think a car of this uh, nature and value and, and, and pedigree deserves to be really taken carefully. I mean, really be very careful with. Uh, I have plenty of cars. I'm very fortunate that I drive, and I drive to drive cars and drive them a lot. But frankly, that car, I, I think, needs to have extra care. Now, we service the car. It does get driven just a little bit because we want to keep everything working like we know that it needs to have done. But as far as uh, doing that, we haven't. We do have a show here, um, an annual show that we obviously display the car in. And some people, it's interesting. Some people catch on to it. Others just walk by and think it's just another white Camaro. But uh, other than that, no, we really haven't made a point of taking it. Um, to shows. You mentioned again uh, a connection with the white Camaro and here we are we're surrounded by an impressive <laughs> array of white Camaros of all kinds of vintages. Where did that affinity come from for, for, for white paint on a Camaro? Well growing up in California I grew up in the Central Valley in Bakersfield and uh, uh, I, I, I grew up and at an early age I realized that everything was painted white and it was painted white because it was a very dusty environment. So, and it was a very hot environment, much like we have living in here where we live today. So I guess the white always made sense to me. Uh, and I felt like I, you know, I had to keep my cars clean and I felt like it could keep it really clean. And it was also a cooler car to drive. So I guess that's kind of my, my, my fondness for white cars. Now, um, when it came, to f I know that all of these cars were processed through Berger, um, and I know you're working with Dick Jocks, who's also still involved with, with, with the happenings there in Grand Rapids. Um, 
at any point did you have any dialogue or conversation with Matt Murphy or the GMMG team there in Marietta, Georgia? We did. I actually knew Matt. Uh, we had sold a few other of his cars that he built. Uh, I'm going to say probably sold five or six over the, the, the course of time. So I did develop a friendship with Matt. His father, Matt, a lot of Matt's, Matt Murphy. Matt was, uh, his father was also in the Chevrolet business and was a, an executive and I knew his father. So there was a, a definite connection there. It's uh, the, the, the business we're in is actually a very small business and you seem to know a lot of people in it. So yes, I definitely had a connection with him and I, I really respected what uh, Matt Murphy was trying to do. He was really a leader at the time and that he was in the forefront of doing these kind of conversions and basically had General Motors um, okay to do it, which was highly unusual. Right, you know, that's one of the fascinating aspect, aspects of this era uh, is how Scott Settlemeyer with the General Motors team was supporting the effort, working to, to help make it succeed. Uh, and I think that that's a lot of the interest for what the cars, uh, for their story. Um, as we kind of wind down here, what are your thoughts about uh, the, this era, the, the, the Berger, GMG era of cars and kind of the legacy they left behind? Uh, what are your thoughts about how it resonates with enthusiasts today? Oh, I think it does you know, very, very well. I mean, we were very fortunate that Scott Settlemeyer was with Chevrolet. If he wasn't uh, there and so passionate about the Camaro, it, we would have lost it many, many years ago. Wonderful, wonderful guy was just the best he could be to uh, the industry and into keeping Camaro alive and well. Um, you know, I think people today, it's interesting now that people are uh, gravitating to Firebirds, which I never thought would, I would see. There's a, quite an interest in Firebirds because they're a little more unique and a little more uh, a, select, a, a smaller selection of those. But uh, I, uh, as we sit here today, we're, our Camaro, the 2024 Camaro, will be the last model that we'll have for a few years. It is rumored that we'll get electric Camaro, and um, I'm hoping that the narrow Camaro nameplate comes back, and I hope it comes back in the in the fashion that it should as a true sports car. Well said. Well, any other memories with the car behind us from from the years that you've owned it? No, I don't. I don't think so, Matt. I'm I'm very honored today that you take the time and come and and spend the time filming the car and interviewing and 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 going through the process. I think that speaks a lot. You're a much younger guy, and I'm glad to see younger people interested in this. I think you told me you've now documented 18 of them, 17 yeah, of them? 17. So, so that's, that's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> I mean, that is really an accomplishment. So I appreciate what you're doing. Keep up the well, good work, you. my friend. Well, okay? hey, thanks for the access right. today. It's an incredible car, and I really appreciate you sharing the story. Great. Thank you.